and uh, she uh, uh, had some kind of new medicine. She's a guinea pig, trying this new medicine, and hopefully that'll that'll stop that problem. But uh, um, Samantha called me um, uh, Sunday morning. She put this couple, CJ and uh, Taylor Earl, uh, on the prayer list, and so she called me. I don't know Monday or Tuesday. I don't remember now. Anyway, this this little couple. He's 31 and he's got some sort of serious cancer in his lungs and uh, it's probably not gonna make it um, uh, only through a miracle and they got two little babies and they don't have anybody to take to help except her parents and and so Samantha's tried to get her to come to church and let her parents take care of the kids so it's just kind of get them away get, give her a little break and uh, but anyway uh, just 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 a lot of things going on in the world guys let's let's pray father we thank you for today uh, I, I do that every day, Lord, when I pray. I thank you every day because I just realize how precious every day on this earth is. And uh, people are experiencing all kinds of issues in their lives. Uh, and uh, But, Lord, we thank you that you're available. Uh, and and we, we thank you that you've given us a heart to help, uh, that you've given us a, a, a church full of people that are servants and just want to reach out and, and uh, be examples that you set for us, Lord, just to reach out and love on people uh, lord so we just pray for this little couple for cj that's got this serious cancer and and we've got other people in our church that are dealing with cancer and so we we just lift them all up to you lord thank you for uh, tanya that she's home and we pray that you just uh, heal her that's what you do lord uh, you're a healing healing lord and and god almighty and sovereign lord that's what you do uh, thank you for carol pray that this drug helps her and so many others lord that are dealing with issues in their life and uh, illnesses from from young people to, to old old people but uh, people of all ages lord uh, so we just put them in your hands and know that you're the god that can take care of them and heal them, lord uh, be with us tonight lord we talked about your business a little bit and uh, just w uh, wipe out the day's issues uh, from our brain and let us focus on you that's uh, that's what we're called to do so we just thank you for the opportunity to gather up in jesus name we pray amen so turn your bible to first peter um Paul and I are going to be gone the next two Wednesday nights. We're taking our grandkids to Florida, and so uh, I'm not sure who's going to teach yet, but don't not come. Come and be a part of whoever's going to teach. So we're going to, I don't want to start Revelation 9 tonight uh, because it's a two-night deal, and I don't want to do part of it now and then part of it when I get back. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, vertical and horizontal uh, tonight. We're going to talk about <clears throat> discipleship, and really it's just an extension of gather, grow, and produce. How do we make disciples? And so what's the, what's the, the number one supreme mission of the church? Um, it, it's to love people. It's to, to make disciples. And in, um, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, get this thing untangled here. In 1 Peter 3, 9, here's what Peter says. He said, the Lord does not delay his promise. Uh, he, some people, we think he delays sometimes, but he does things in his time. He said, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay. He's saying, as some, as the humans understand delay, but is patient with us. He is patient with us, not wanting any to perish. He doesn't want any to die. He said, but all to come to repentance. He wants all people to come to a place in their life where they repent of their sins and they receive the gift of salvation. Uh, so that's... Uh, he, that's who he is. So the first verse blank, it says, it's never been God's will for anyone to die, only that they come to repentance. That's the first blank. Over in Romans, uh, I'll get to uh, to Second Peter. Just say First Peter. I'll get to First Peter here in a minute. In Romans 10, uh, I'm not going to read that. You can go read it. But I looked at the number of different translations. So the, the NLT, which is our Learn the Ropes Bible out there, how can people call, that's the blank, how can people call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How, how can people call on him if they don't believe in him? And the next question is, how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? I'm always amazed at talking to people that have never heard about Christ in, in America. It just blows me away. The next question is, and how can they hear about him Unless someone tells them. Unless someone tells them. And how can anyone go and tell them without being sent? 
Every one of us has been sent. If we are believers, we are, we are under the command of Jesus to go and make disciples. He said, go. So we, we fill all those blanks ourselves. I mean, uh, we're supposed to, to tell people so that they can, they can know how to believe in him. They can know how to hear him. And, and, and we just keep going. The apostles, they, they went and they, uh, they, they, they dispersed and they, they shared the gospel and they told people about Jesus. And we're just an extension of those, those disciples. So Apostle Paul, he just gives us this chain of events here that has to occur for a person to be saved. Uh, there can be no belief if they don't know. Now, there's a, a lot of people, and I was one of them, uh, baptized at eight and in and out of church my whole life, and, and I had a lot of knowledge about Jesus, intellectual knowledge, but I had no knowledge of who he was. I had no relationship with him there's a difference in having knowledge and having a relationship and and so that's that's a difference and and so um the great commission matthew 28 19 20 jesus said go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit and he says at the end of the great commission he said i will be with you until the age end of the age he's telling us that we cannot do that on our own we have to have that relationship. So the, what's the vertical and the horizontal? The vertical is a relationship with the Father. That's vertical. And if we don't have that vertical, we can't have the horizontal relationship to go and make disciples. We must have that deep-rooted faith in Christ, that vertical relationship. If you don't have that, we, we, don't, we don't have anything. I never had that. I never understood that. Um, and you know my you know my story and all that. But listen, his command is to go. How do we do that? How would you do that? Think about that. How would you go? How would you go? You met someone. You had discernment. The Lord put somebody in your path that never heard about him. What are you going to tell them? Ask yourself that. What are you going to tell them? You got a testimony. If you are a blood-bought, born-again believer, you have a testimony. How are you going to tell them? The disciples said, "Who?" Jesus said, asked the disciples, "Who do you say that I am?" I, I couldn't answer that question. Do you know him? Do, do you know anything about him? Do you, I mean, other than the fact you you know his name and maybe he was a, 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 an apostle or whatever. What do you know him? We have to be careful. We don't want to mash on people. Uh, to turn them away because I, I've been mashed on before even as a believer when somebody come up and say here here's this track I want you to have this and I've said look man um, I don't need that yeah you need that I said I don't need that I know Christ is my savior I'm I'm a I don't tell him I'm a pastor I say look I know him and I share the gospel he said well you need to take it. I said no I'm not going to take it you give it to somebody who needs it somebody who doesn't know Christ don't mash on them. We're not going to mash you. We're not going to push you. We're not, but we want you to know. And so we want, in order for us to know, we have to have that vertical relationship, that deep-rooted faith in Christ. I was looking at this guy today uh, uh, and he, he, on, on Facebook, and he, he, somebody said, hey, can you share the gospel? Uh, can you, in one minute or less? He goes, hmm, well, let me think about it. So here's what he said. He says, are you ready? He said, better, better uh, buckle your seatbelt and put your tray table up. He said, get ready because we're fixing to take off. So here's what he said. He said, from Genesis to Malachi, he's coming. He's coming. And he said, the king is coming. Jesus is coming. That's right. And from Matthew to John, he's here doing stuff. He is busy. He is setting an example for us. And you better be paying attention. You better be reading carefully. And then he said, from Acts to Revelation, he's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back for the second time. He's coming to get his people. He's coming to get us. So remember, he died for us, so live for him. He said, there you go. Got it. Less than a minute. Pretty funny. I mean, I, it was just, he was just, I don't know who this guy was, but it was just funny just to listen to him. But this, that's the deal. He died for us, so live for him. How do we live for him? Dave and I and Tim were talking a while ago, and he was talking about these missionaries. <clears throat> he was, David had been reading a story about these two guys that had been somewhere in the world, and they'd been 
way off. I don't know if it was a jungle or a desert or where they were, but they'd been off by themselves. One guy had been in this one place for like 23 years and another guy for some, I don't know, 16 or 17, I don't know how long, and not had one convert. How do those men keep going for that long with not one convert? How? Because they know their calling. They have that vertical relationship with Christ and their faith is deep-rooted in him and they know their calling. But after they left, after they died, I guess they died, I don't know, they didn't say that. They left, this, some new missionaries came in there and the place ballooned with converts because of what these two guys had done. They were faithful. They were obedient to their calling. And every one of us is called. Whether you realize that or not, we are all called to go and make disciples. That vertical relationship is so important. So unless we get... <laughs> Actually, I wrote this backwards. I was writing this afternoon. So I wrote, unless we get the horizontal part right, the vertical will not work. Actually, it's the other way around. Unless we get the vertical right, the horizontal is not going to work. So y'all change that. Unless we get the vertical part right, the horizontal is just not going to work because then we're just doing things on our own. And we will not accomplish anything on our own. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 8, here's what, here's what Paul said. He says, although we could, nope, verse 8, we cared so much for you. Paul said, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives because you had become dear to us. Listen, everyone should be dear to us. And, 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 and we, we should care for people as Jesus cared for people. Jesus said, go feed them. Two times in the last week, I've, well, we've had the opportunity as a church to, to help somebody with food. And, and he said, feed them. So the, we, we, that's the very least we can do. But listen, we, we cannot care for unbelievers, the blank. We cannot care for unbelievers, and we cannot be pleased if we don't share the gospel. We can't be pleased. We can't even share our own lives. He said, he says right here, he says, to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. He's talking about our testimony. If you can't remember when you got saved, the, the place and the time, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure that you got saved. I'm not, I don't know. But I, I've talked to so many pastors about that, and, and that's, that's what we believe. If you don't know the time, if you don't know when God, you, you, you got on your knees and you cried out to the Lord and you asked him to, to, to come into your life and, and, and receive that gift of salvation, if you don't know when that is, you don't have the vertical part right. I, I just, that's just the way I feel about it. Yeah. Okay. So, but weren't if I remember, weren't you in church your whole life? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so let me tell you the story. Uh, this this guy, <laughs> he was eighty eight years old. Well, let, let me just say this. I will say, I, I can I can change that. But I, I think for guys like, uh, pardon the expression, older guys, this guy that was 88 years old, he came to me and said, I don't remember that either. He said, my mother, I was in church the day I was born, and he said, I think I've been there my whole life. And he said, I don't know. He said, I just know in my heart that I got saved. But I run into a lot of people, Ron, that say they, they know Christ, but they, they, they don't. They, they just know him intellectually. And, and so, but I think there's a lot of people who believe that they're believers, but there's no evidence that in their life. There's lots of evidence in your life. So, I mean, I, I hear where you're coming from. Um, so, there can be no vertical relationship. Again, I wrote it wrong. There can be no horizontal relationship without the vertical relationship. The vertical is what makes everything go. So, again, every single one of us is personally, that's the blank, personally 
called by Christ to walk with Jesus. He, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And I can only talk about my own personal experience and, and, and men that I've seen their lives transformed. Mine was transformed. Many of you in here, your lives were transformed. We were all personally called by Christ. And so what that means is, it, it, here in, 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 we know what happened in Acts 2. In verse 8 of Acts 2, it says, here is where he said, So how is it that each of us can hear in our own native language? Now, Here's the deal. If you go on and read in verse 9, he lists a whole bunch of people, the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius. He's talking about all these people all over the Middle East. And if you look at a map, they're all kind of in this, they're spread out, but they're all in this one part of Asia. And so he said, how is it that each of us can hear by our own language? It's by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He allows that. And so... Jesus was the power source in the first century. He was the power source of the, of, of the disciples, and he is the power source for us today. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Um, it's that, that vertical relationship that's rooted in Christ, and, 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 the, and that, that allows the horizontal relationship to be right there for us that we can go and make disciples. And don't say there's no way I can make disciples. Don't say that. That's a that's a that's an escape route. That's a, that's a that's just a way out. Just don't say that. Every one of us, if we are we are true believers, we have the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit. We just have to be courageous, like 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 the Lord told Joshua, be strong and be courageous. And Tim and D Dave and I were talking, and Tim mentioned First Corinthians twelve nine. It says, "My grace is sufficient." And he said, "Paul said, when I'm weak, you're strong." Listen, I'm weak a lot. I mean, I, I, Sunday mornings, as I get up and pray, I, I, Lord, you got to do this because I can't do it on my own. Point is, we can't do it on our own, but the Holy Spirit through us can. The Holy Spirit. It's not our power, it's his power, it's his ability in us. And so this is, this is gather, grow, and produce at its best about making disciples, about uh, starting home Bible studies, and, 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 and just... Uh, just growing together. That, that's what it's about. Uh, again, in the Great Commission, Jesus said at the end of verse 20, he says, I will be with you till the end of the age. He walks with us. He says that in, in the Great Commission. At the end, or in the 23rd Psalm, he, he, the Lord says, He will lead me, He will renew me, and He will walk with me wherever I'm at, whatever circumstance of life I'm going through, He will walk with me. He will, and what it says, He says, You've heard me say this a bajillion times. He says, he will lead me to the still waters, and he will take me to the green pastures. And so no matter what, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through the valley of the shadow of death. And sometimes that can mean death. Sometimes that can mean a, 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 an addiction or a, a circumstance in life. But he says, I will walk with you. I will take you to a better place. That's, that's the key point of that. I will take you to a better place. So discipleship is simply inviting someone to walk beside us as we walk with Christ. Inviting someone to walk beside us. Whether it's mentoring someone, men mentoring men or women mentoring men, women. Uh, uh, J.R. and Sarah out there uh, loving on those kids and mentoring those kids. Listen, it's just simply inviting someone to come alongside. That's, that's the deal. And, and I'll tell you, um, I've had men tell me that they don't need mentoring. When a man tells me that, he's got so much pride built up inside, he is headed for a downfall. I, I've seen it happen. And, and, and so all of us need to be mentored. Men, m women, we all need to be mentored. So in 1 Peter, let's go to 1 Peter. So here's what it says. Peter, an apostle of Christ to the temporary residence of, and again, here we go. He lists a bunch of people here according to the foreknowledge of God. He said, Set apart by the Spirit for obedience. He's telling us that, listen, all you people, we, we are called to be obedient to Christ. He, 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 he's, he's talking about the sprinkling of blood. That, that there, was, there was sprinkling of the blood in the Old Testament. There's no sprinkling of blood in, in, in the New Testament. It's the blood, the flowing blood of Christ through the cross. In verse 3, he says, Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
So he's talking about our creator. He's talking about our redeemer. He's the one who redeems us from our sins. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy. Listen, he has been merciful with us. He sent us his son. He's given us a new birth. He said, uh, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So he's given us a new birth through his son, and he's given us a living hope through his son and his resurrection. So what we see there, he, he, we, 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 we got Jesus in, the, in, in his mercy, uh, and we got Jesus in this new birth, and we've got this living hope through, through Jesus. Everything, everything is through Christ. And so every time the gospel records that Jesus addressed God, this is interesting, only one time, only one time did Jesus not call God Father or my Father. Only one time, and that time was when he was on the cross uh, in Matthew 27, 46. Here's what Jesus said. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only time in the scriptures he didn't call him Father or my Father. The same, the same verse is in Psalm 22, 1. That's a prophecy of the cross there in Psalm 22, 1. In verse 4, he says this. He said, and into an inheritance... An inheritance. What have we inherited? We have inherited salvation. We have inherited hope. We have inherited life. He said, that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading. In other words, listen, it's not going away. It is permanent. This inheritance we have from him by receiving the gift of salvation, it is permanent. And it is reserved for us. I love what he says here. Unfading, kept in heaven for you. It is a space reserved for, for us. He said, uh, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going I'm to prepare a place for you. And then I'm coming back to get you so that I can take you with me. He's got that place reserved for us. In verse 5, he says, you are being protected by God's power. What do we got to lose by stepping out and and inviting somebody to, to, to walk with us. We, we, we're protected by the power. Why are we afraid of Satan? Listen, he's out there and he's looking to, to kill us. To steal, kill, and destroy. He is after us. He is prowling around out there looking for someone to devour. Look, he can't touch us if we're being obedient. If we're being faithful. Because we are protected by the power of God. It says through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. He ain't got nothing for us except doom if we let him in the door. We should know that we have God's power or strength. That's the next blank, verse 5. Though It is available to us right now. In verse 6, I love this. He says, you rejoice in this. Now, <laughs> he's talking about joy. So our joy... It should be, or, or, or it should be deeper than any temporary happiness. Happiness is temporary. And our joy should be everlasting. Uh, <laughs> think about the Apostle Paul in Philippians. Now, Paul is in prison, and he's in, he's in one of the most miserable times in his life. He's in the worst Roman prison that he can be in, the Mamertine prison. And in and, and, and all four chapters of Philippians, Paul uses the word joy, or rejoice, or again rejoice. He In every chapter, he's talking about joy, being filled with joy. We should be filled with joy. No matter what our circumstances are, we can rejoice. This uh, couple that I, uh, I shared with you that lost their 17-year-old son about a month ago, um, they, are, they are desperately trying to rejoice. And this mama, I talked to her today. I haven't seen them in about three weeks, and so I'm going to try to see them this week. <clears throat> kind of let them be, spend some time together. But they're, they're, they got a deep-rooted faith. They have that vertical relationship with Christ. In spite of losing that, that son, they're just, they're, they're striving to be joyful, knowing where he's at. Tough, tough deal. 
In verse 7, Peter goes on to say, well, let me finish 6. He says, you rejoice in this, though now for a short time you've had to struggle in various trials. Hey, we're all going to go through trials. Paul is in the trial, uh, another trial of his life. He is chained to a, uh, just a big post in the dark dungeon of this prison. And, and he's, it, it, it's, it's damp and it's dirty. And, and I just can't imagine how horrible it is. He's going through a trial. It's a temporary trial. And we're all going to go through temporary trials at, at various times. He said, verse 7, he said, so that the genuineness of your faith is more valuable than gold. It, again, it's that vertical relationship. So our trials and struggle, struggles, the, the hardships that we go through, they're gifts. It's hard to imagine, but they are gifts from God. Well, how does that work? Well, look, in all those situations, um, if we are faithful, if we're obedient, we trust him, we give everything to him, we're going to come out on the other side a lot stronger. We're going to come through the all, whatever it is we're going through, that valley, we're going we're gonna to be more spiritually mature. This family is, 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 is growing. Uh, I see that in them by listening to them. <clears throat> in verse 8 and 9, Peter says, you love him, though you haven't seen him. I'll never forget this experience uh, when we were going to prison all the time. The, one of the first times I went, I was walking with this guy because I, I didn't know what I was doing in there. But I knew that's where I was supposed to be. So I'm going with this guy who was a, 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 he, he was a, been going to prison, these crusades, for years. And he, we, we walked to the door of this, this cell, and there was this guy in there, and talked to him a little bit. I just listened. He was a, uh, a white-collar crime guy. He's an educated engineer. And uh, he uh, was in, in prison for white-collar crime. And he said, I, I don't believe all this stuff. I can't believe anything I can't see. And I mean just spontaneous. Skip pulled a pen out of his pocket and said, you believe in gravity, don't you? And he threw that, that pen to the floor. That guy hit his knees and asked Christ to come into his life right then. I saw that with my own eyes. Can't see gravity, but it's real. Can't see Christ, but it's real. We see Christ through lives. The examples that, that, that people, how they live their lives. Um, <laughs> So a lot of people get hung up on that deal saying, see, is believing. Eh, I don't know. But w we haven't seen Jesus in the body like we like the disciples did. But we see him in and through uh, each of us. I mean, you guys are our core core bunch. You're, you're, you're faithful to come on Wednesday nights, and you're here for a reason. You, you have that vertical relationship, and you want to grow. You want to mature in, in the Word. And, and But there are others that come to church. They're just... You know, that, that there's no service in them. They, they just, they, I don't know. They, it's like I used to be. I went to church, and I didn't want to be there. I'll just be honest with you. But, but only Christ can transform your life. And we've seen that in many, many other lives. We've seen the power of that vertical relationship. So even though we haven't seen him like the apostles, many others have, we can believe in him. And so how would, how would you describe your salvation experience? Uh, that, that guy that... Uh, I was telling you about that 88-year-old. He, he told me, he said, man, he said, I never heard grace in my life until the last few years through this, this one pastor that was the pastor of this church. He said, I don't even know what that is. He said, I've been in church my whole life. But he was honest enough to say that. And, and that's, so he, he was like Ron. He really didn't know what his salvation experience was. But he just knew he'd been in church all his life. And so I like what, what Peter says here. He says, you love him, though you have not seen him, and though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with, love this word, inexpressible and glorious joy. <clears throat> There's really no words. To, if, you, if you had, you know, I like what uh, Elijah said over in Kings when, when he, you know, the Lord said, you go out, stand on the mountain, the Lord's fixed to come by. And he said there was a great wind, and the Lord wasn't in the wind. There was a great fire, and the Lord wasn't in the fire, and there was something great. And he said, then I heard this still, small voice. A lot of times people hear that still, sp small voice of the Holy Spirit. Not everybody has this, this super, big-time, supernatural salvation experience like, like I did. But the thing is, it's inexpressible. The word, how do you, you just tell the story. I, I 
People go, I, I don't know that I believe that or not. Look, I, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. But you know that, what's that saying? That God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. It don't matter whether you believe it or not. God said it, it settles it. Inexpressible. Verse 9, it says this. Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, and that's the salvation of your souls. We are secure in our salvation. We know without a doubt, a shadow of a doubt, that when we leave this earth, whatever time the Lord says I'm calling you on, we're going to be with him in heaven. We're going to be in paradise. Now, like in verse 10, Peter gets around this. He said, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you, he's talking about future future salvation. He's talking about future grace. It's going to come to you. He says, search, the prophets searched and carefully investigated salvation. Now think about that. These guys, man, they, they, they're, they're, they were prophets inspired by the Holy Spirit. And do you think they ever wondered about this salvation? What, is the, what did that really mean to those guys? I mean, they wrote about it. Uh, Jeremiah and, and all these other guys, they wrote about it. The thing is, there was no such thing as saving grace in the Old Testament. God was definitely gracious to those in the Old Testament. No question about that. They believed before Christ came. In, in Psalm 84, 11, um, let me read you what, what, that, what he said there. In 84, where is 84? 85, 11. It says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Integrity is being obedient and, and follow the example of Christ. That, that, that's what that is. And, and he has certainly been gracious to all of us who believe. He's been gracious to us. He's been gracious to our church. In John 1.14, he says, the, 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 uh, the word became flesh. He became a human. He was incarnated. He became, came to the earth as a, as a human being. He became flesh, and he lived among us as a human being. He set the example for us on how we're to live our lives and following him. And so, the Old Testament prophets, they wanted to know about that future salvation grace. So they made some, uh, the King James, New King James says, they made careful searches and inquiries. In other words, they started digging. They started digging in the scrolls and whatever other sources they had to, to find out about this salvation and this future, this future salvation grace. In 1 John, um, I didn't write that, uh, mark that, let me get here. 1 John 5, 12, 13, it says this. The one who has the Son has life. Pretty straightforward. The one who doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. And 13, he says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I've written these things so that you may know. So you may know, you may know, you may know that you may know that you have eternal life so we have the promise of knowing we will see jesus in the final days and so we know that those prophecies given to the prophets were de divinely inspired they were divinely inspired they wrote under the direct supervision of the holy spirit john MacArthur writes that the overall theme of those prophecies theme of the prophecy was twofold the sufferings of christ and the glories to follow the sufferings of Christ and the glories of Father. So we've read about the many sufferings of Christ. We've read about how he was mocked, how he was spit on, how he was beaten on the stump, how he had to carry his cross to Golgotha, how he was uh, nailed to the cross, how he bled, he suffered, he tried to breathe, he couldn't breathe, and he died on the cross. We've read about, we've read about all those sufferings of Christ. The glories to follow included truths like the resurrection and his ascension to heaven and his place on the throne. The glory is to follow. And we will be with him someday. So Peter tells us. Let me read on here. First Peter. He said. They inquired into what time and what circumstances the spirit of Christ within them was indicating. The spirit of Christ was indicating them when, when he tested testified in advance to the messianic sufferings he'd already testified to that and the glories that would follow 
verse 12, he says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. What does that mean? I had to go dig a little bit to find out. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets were not serving themselves, but they were serving the New Testament believers. He said, these things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And so the Spirit of Christ within them indicated as he testified in advance to his sufferings and his glories in the future. And the Holy Spirit revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And so who is you? I write the the Holy Testament prophets, just like I said, we're not serving themselves but the New Testament believers. The true message of the gospel is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me, except by me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so verse 13, closing up, here's what he said. Therefore, with your minds ready for action. Are you ready for action? Vertically, horizontally, go Make disciples with your minds ready for action. Be serious. Set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The only way to be ready to make certain that you have that vertical connection to Christ. That's the only way you have to make certain that you have that vertical connection to Christ. Otherwise, there can be no horizontal relationship. There can be no making of disciples. Vertically. So that we can go horizontally, wherever we are. 